Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and I am excited today on Come to the Library to highlight a wonderful book called Self Therapy by Jay Early. And this is one of the books that I recommend to people when they're new to IFS, either No Bad Parts by Dick Schwartz or Self Therapy by Jay Early. This is such a user friendly book. <laughs> it's got um, illustrations, it's got uh, sample sessions, it's got um, exercises to do. It's just really easy to read and understand. And so one of the first IFS YouTube videos that I ever saw was of a woman reading what I'm going to read to you today, which is the entirety of chapter three, which is a sample session from beginning to end that illustrates the entire IFS process. And Jay says he chose this because while, you know, a lot of IFS uh, therapy sessions can go in many different directions, this really helps illustrate it in a very straightforward way. So it's got the six Fs, it's got find, focus, flesh out, feel toward, um, befriend, and fears. And then it's also got the process with the exile of witnessing, reparenting, redoing, retrieving, unburdening, and integrating. So um, it's a little bit of a long chapter. Hopefully my voice can get through it. I've got my water here. <clears throat> and this is, interestingly, a client named Christine. And Jay says, Christine is a 50-year-old college teacher from the West Coast, the youngest of three sisters. She is of British extraction, but has lived in the U.S. for many years. She has engaged in many years of therapy and spiritual work, and she joined my class to learn more about how to heal psychological issues. You will be able to tell from the transcript that she's quite intelligent and able to access subtle experiences in herself with clarity. Prior to my class, she had done some therapy work involving childhood hospitalizations that seemed to cause repeated panic. She also had memories of her sisters running away and leaving her, but had not yet worked on them. Since she was in my class, she already knew a fair amount about the IFS model, which helped her in this work. I chose this, sec this session because um, the work moves in a fairly straightforward way, which is helpful for an initial demonstration of IFS. Most sessions involve many more complications and sidetracks. That's true. And that's good to keep in mind if you're doing it with yourself or with someone else. But I know for me, it was very helpful to see a very simplified, clear, direct version early on uh, to really get how IFS looks. Um, and he says, you know, IFS, the IFS model is excellent at handling these complications and sidetracks. Um, but here he gives this beautiful example. All right. So from now on, I will read the parts. <laughs> Christine says, I would like to work on how I get confused and distracted sometimes. Most of the time, I'm quite clear and sharp but every once in a while I get fuzzy and confused. And this often happens in situations where I need to have my mental acuity. So Jay says, okay, it sounds like there's a part of you that becomes confused at times. Does that make sense to you? Christine says, yes. Jay says, so let's focus on that confused part. How do you sense it in or around your body? Christine says, well, when it happens, I feel a slight dizziness and a blankness in my head. <clears throat> and then Jay puts this note. He says, in IFS, we don't analyze our parts. We contact them directly. This is a difference in um, traditional therapy where we kind of talk about external experiences or even our own experiences in somewhat of a detached way. Um, in IFS, the real unique thing, and I, the reason why it's effective, in my opinion, is that it promotes an internal relationship. You know, Martha Sweezy would always talk about the YOU turn, where you're go turning around and relating to what's alive in you. 
And so the understanding that we are multiples is actually really helpful because there's relationship inside. And when we relate inside, that's how we heal. And you'll see too here, if you've been following with my my sample sessions for Martha Sweezy, that Jay has a little bit of a different um, uh, way that he does sessions. And I, I love it. I love seeing all the different nuances of, of different um, approaches and different, you know, people's personalities coming out. So Jay says, uh, mm -hmm. check and see if you are feeling separate enough from the part to get to know it. Christine says, well, I'm not sure. I think so. Hmm. How would I tell? Jay says, do you sense in yourself a clear place from which to connect with the confused part? He has a note that says, in order for the work to be effective, Christine must be in self as she gets to know the part. This means she must be in a grounded, separate place from which she can relate to the part. So he's checking, is there space between you and the part from which you can relate to it? And Christine says, I'm having a hard time telling about that. She pauses. What question did you ask me? And Jay says, it sounds like you may be blended with the confused part right now. So ask that part if it can separate from you so that you can get to know it. it he says, it seems pretty clear that Christine is confused right now. This probably means that the confused part has taken her over or blended with her. Therefore, I have her ask it to separate so she can be in self. Christine says, okay, well, now I feel differently. I feel more solid or something. And I actually see an image of the part as a cloud or smoke. So now she's unblended. There's a, a differentiation between her now viewing the part. Not everyone sees their parts but they, you might have a sense of it in front of you or where it is in your body. There's the one who sees or observes it and the one and the part itself. Um, so Jay says, good, check to see how you are feeling toward this confused part right now. So you can see um, they found the part, she identified this confused part, he had her focus on it, um, he had to flesh it out by where do you feel it in or around your body and then now and, and make sure she's unblended from it enough to give it some attention and now he's checking for self energy by saying how do you feel toward it christine says i wish it would go away i hate being confused so does that sound like self to you <laughs> no so it's clear that she's blended with a part who hates the the confused part so Jay says, okay, that hatred and desire for it to go away are coming from another part of you. I understand why that part of you would want to the confused part to go away. So there's a, a validation of that. So you won't lose your sharpness. But approaching it from a place of hatred won't work. Ask the hateful part if it would be willing to step aside so that you can get to know the confused part from an open place. So whenever a part comes in and kind of blocks the way, we first ask if it's willing to give space. Um, if it can't, then we'll redirect and go to it. But if it can, we want to check. Um, yeah, and he says, since Christine hates the confused part, I can tell that she's still not in self because self does not hate. So Christine says, sure, that makes sense. It is willing to separate. Jay says, good. So how do you feel toward the confused part now? Christine says, kind of curious about it. Like, why does it do this to me? So Christine has now accessed enough self for us to move on to the next step, getting to know the confused part. So now if uh, it's just as likely that someone, you know, the, the hateful part would step aside and then she would have a part that's afraid of it or a different part, right? So if it doesn't have one of those eight C qualities, um, then we just continue to ask the parts to step aside if they can't, we meet their concerns. Um, but she's got the quality of curiosity. So we're moving forward to befriend the part. So Jay says, 
Okay, invite the part to tell you or show you more about what it feels. And um, that's a good way to say it. Sometimes I'll just say, what does it want you to know about it? Just be open and, and observe. Christine says, it says that it feels sleepy and dull. I sense that it goes blank. And so Jay just reflects back. It feels dull and blank. Christine says, yes, it says, I want to go to sleep. I don't want to be awake or conscious. And sometimes it can't answer people's questions. Jay says, mm hmm ask the part what its name is or what it would like to be called. Christine says, I get the word confuser. So sometimes parts don't want to be named and they'll say, oh, it doesn't matter or something like that. And I will say, can I call you this? And I'll get a yes or no. But it's really great to let a part name itself and just, again, wait for the answer to come from the part. You don't have to think it up, make it up at all. Um, for me, I agree with this. It's been really helpful for me to have names for my parts because it's just like relating to a person outside of you. Um, you relate to them by calling them by name. There's a familiarity there. So having a name when, you know, when my critic Gollum comes in, I say, oh, hey, Gollum, I see you, right? Or when I feel the impulse of my people pleaser, Cassandra, I say, oh, Cassandra, I see that you're really feeling upset right now, right? And, and it helps me relate to them. So this one, though, says the word confuser. And Jay says, okay, we'll call it the confuser. Ask it what it is trying to accomplish by being sleepy and confused. He says, I pose this question to discover the confuser's positive intention for Christine. Christine says, it says, I don't want to see something. I don't want to know something. This part has to just make unclarity and confusion, blandness. It wants to make sure that I don't know what is going on. Jay says, it, so it creates confusion to protect you from whatever's going on. You might ask the part how it creates confusion and not knowing. <clears throat> Christine says, various things. It internally changes the subject. It takes my attention away. It looks or acts very agitated. So there's no settling or landing in one place. It draws attention to itself and therefore away from whatever else is there. All those ways. And now the part looks like a person who's making a magic sign in the air to create confusion and distraction. Um, Jay says, it's fairly common for the image of a part to change as you get to know it. Yes, that's been my experience as well. Jay says, um, that's if you see it. Um, again, some people don't see their parts, but they have a knowing. They'll tell me in great detail as if they are seeing the part. Um, and that's completely fine. Jay says, Okay, ask the confuser what it is afraid would happen if it stepped aside and allowed you to see things. Uh, he says, this kind of question serves a specific purpose. It tends to lead the inquiry toward the exile that's being protected. Yes, and as you may have heard me say before, usually it will reveal either the exile it's protecting or another part that it's polarized with. It'll tell you, I'm afraid that this will come up or I'm afraid that that'll come in. Um. And so Christine says, what it says is, what would happen is unthinkable, unspeakable. It's so frightened that we can't even go there. Yeah, that's very often the case, especially when you try to go toward deeper inner work. And there's a part that will literally pull you out into falling asleep, total dissociation, right? Those parts are really, really vigilant protectors. Early on, you think it's just um, coincidence, <laughs> but as you begin to observe, you realize, oh no, every time you go toward this specific subject or memory, they pull you out and they really believe that it is unsafe to go there. They're terrified to go there and they're doing the best they can to make sure you don't. Okay, so oh, I'll just show you this picture <laughs> as a picture of kind of the the confuser is the wizard putting a little spell on her. Um, Jay says, oh, I see. So it's very frightened about this. And Christine says, yes, at a survival level. And this is often the case. 
Jay says, yes, you might ask the confuser how long it has been doing this job. Christine says, it feels like forever. And Jay says, how does it feel about its job? Christine says, it's a completely impossible job. It's overwhelming, yet it is unable to stop. That's often very true as well. Jay says, yeah, see if there's anything else the part wants you to know about itself. Christine says, I feel clearly that it does want my love and respect and gratitude for suffering on my behalf. Mm. Uh, there's a note that says most parts want appreciation for performing their roles, but they rarely ask directly in this way. That's true. <laughs> um, usually as it sounds like Christine's in self and she's really getting this information, usually the self just very naturally feels connected, feels grateful and appreciative and expresses that. And the parts really, really respond well to that. Um, especially, you know, there were parts in the system that hated it, probably want it to go away. And that's what it usually is used to uh, being communicated to it. So when the self says, oh, I see that you're really afraid and you're doing this thankless job to, you know, protect me in this, in this extreme way. I appreciate you. It's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. You finally see me. Um, so Jay says, what's your response to that? And Christine says, I do feel a lot of appreciation. And Jay says, so let the confuser know that. Christine says, I feel I can't even express in words how much I appreciate the degree of dedication and desperation this part has shown in doing this job. And Christine appears really moved. So it seems very genuine. And Jay says, yes, so you really get it. How is the part responding to you? Christine says, it's softening. And as it softens, I see one very clear thing. When I said earlier that it didn't know how to stop, that was because it had no connection with myself. There was nothing for it to release into, to relax into. But now the confuser is softening because it does sense that I'm here. Yeah, so that's beautiful. Um, Jay says, this is very moving to me. Christine's really connected with the confuser from self and is beginning. it is beginning to trust her and to relax. This is a very important step. Yeah, when our protectors really feel seen and understood and appreciated, that's when they know, you know, their experience with our self is what allows them to trust that the self can actually go to what they protect. Because they, oh, there's someone here to help me now. I trust that. I believe it. You see me. You get how important my job is. I can trust you, right? So, um, so Jay says, good. Ask the confuser if it would be willing to show you a part that it's protecting by its, or with its confusion. Um. Jay says, most protectors cannot completely let go of their roles until the exile they're protecting is no longer in pain. So we need to heal that part. Christine says, oh, now I'm getting a glimpse of a panic state behind the confuser. Yeah, often when a protector begins to give you permission to go to what they protect, you will feel some of the emotion. You'll feel some grief, sadness come up, some of the panic, some of the, the helplessness, hopelessness, despair. Um, you'll, you'll feel it in your body begin to rise up because it's no longer being, being controlled and tamped down. And that's actually a really good sign, um, especially if, like in this example, the protector has gained trust in the self. And, you know, it's really, really, I just want to make a quick point. It's really accentuated um, in IFS training that you don't go to exiles without permission from protectors who trust the self to do it. 100% true. Very, very, very true. But I also want to say that it's also important that once you get the protector's trust in the self, that you do go to the exile and, and help it. Because without that, the protector cannot fully soften. And so um, it's, it's a disservice to get there and get permission and not go there as well. 
Um, all right, so she's getting a glimpse of the panic state behind the confuser. So Jay says, check to see if the confuser will give you permission to get to know the panicked part. So even once you start to feel it, keep checking. Is it okay? Is it okay? Because if the part has any reservation about it, doesn't want you to go toward it and you go toward it anyway, there will be backlash, right? So keep checking. If she says, okay, it's not sure about this. It's very nervous. So Jay says, you might ask it what it is worried about. What is it afraid will happen? And there's a note that says, since the protector has concerns about proceeding, we need to find out what these are so that we can reassure it. Otherwise, it will not give us permission to work with the exile. Christine says, the confuser is afraid that the exile will come rushing up and swamp me. This is a very common concern of protectors. That's why they protect. That's why they keep them away. They're afraid of them overwhelming the system. So Jay says, you might invite it to signal us in some way if it feels like the exile is beginning to swamp you, because we can keep that from happening. This protector can actually help us by letting us know if that starts to happen so that you can return to self. And Jay has a note that says, IFS has techniques for helping a person stay in self and not be flooded by an exile's emotions, which will be covered in a later chapter. So read the book. <laughs> I reassure their protector that this is possible and I invite it to help her do that. So Christine says, all right, it seems okay with that. And that's a beautiful a strategy is enlist the help of the protector. You can stand by, you can signal, you can support. If you think it's overwhelming, then we can revisit and, and try to unblend and there's lots of different ways to help the exile titrate their their energy um okay so it seems okay with that and christine says now there are all sorts of judgments coming up i'll be too slow i'll go meandering all over the place nothing will happen so this first reassurance seems to have worked and now the confusers other fears are coming out this is a good example of noticing what's kind of blocking the way and then turning toward the, the protector, the confuser, and um, or maybe other judgmental parts and meeting their concerns before going forward. Christine says, I am telling the confuser that I can understand his concerns, but I do not think that will happen. We have tried things like this before and I have shown myself to be helpful when given the chance. And you, Jay, are there as well to offer support. So I suggested to the confuser that it's a chance to find new territory where it can relax and not have to work so hard. So she's kind of offering this experiment. Can you see if this is a good opportunity for you to relax? She suggests that the protector has something to gain by allowing us to proceed. Yes. Um, kind of a, a negotiation of type of sorts. So Jay says, good. How is it responding? Christine says, okay, these images are so funny. The confuser sort of sat back in a lawn chair and crossed its legs to watch what happens next. It's so funny. Oh my goodness. And she starts laughing. And the note says, the fact that the confuser sits back indicates that Christine's reassurance has worked. Yes. And it is giving permission to proceed with the exile. Her parts can trust her fairly easily. This is an indication of how much work Christine has already done in herself. Yeah. Yeah. When there's um, this type of self energy, because you, you notice that she's, you have to have a bit of confidence and calm clarity and connection to the part in order to, to say, Hey, I know I can help you you can relax to give them this hope, right? You can tell she's himself. All right, Jay says, good. And Christine says, so here's the exile. She's very little and skinny and quite frail. It's interesting because I am tall and strong, but she is in a little dress. She's quite vulnerable in her small, light little body. She's all knotted up in her throat and she's watching on the edge of panic. 
Jay says, mm-hmm. You might ask this part what she would like to be called. Christine says, I guess just the little girl. Jay says, okay, ask the little girl what she is frightened of. Christine says that she's going to be left alone in the dark and nobody, nobody will be there. It's so interesting. Now she's panicking and it's too much for me. So the little girl's panic is blending with Christine, right? Um, sometimes when you watch a client uh, and, and you can tell the exile is blending with them, and they might speak as the exile or that you can tell they're feeling their emotions. You can ask them, is this too much for you? It sounds like she's aware that it is. So Jay says, let her know that it's okay for her to be scared, but ask her not to flood you with it so that you can be with her. So it's kind of making, letting the part know, hey, I am here. I'm here with you. But if you take over, I can't be with you. So you can show me your emotion, but maybe take a little bit out so that I can be with you. Because this was the, the fear of the confuser, right? Was that the, it would overtake her. So Jay's helping with that. Christine says, I am okay now. I don't feel too scared anymore. It's good that she's allowed to feel the panic because otherwise she would go away. Very true. So this is why exiles fled us because they are used to being pressed down so much that they're constantly trying to push up. And if, if there's an opportunity, they'll burst out and overwhelm. But if they know that you're not trying to push them down, you're not trying to make them go away, you actually want to listen to them, then they don't have to flood and overwhelm the system. They can just, you know, show you in a, a less intense way. So once they know that you're not trying to get rid of them, they will show you. Uh, there's a note that says, this shows the importance of making it clear to the exile that asking it to separate does not mean that it cannot feel its emotions. If this exile felt that her emotions were not allowed, she would not have trusted Christine enough to stay around. Very true. The self actually can handle the entirety of the exile's emotion at a hundred percent. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the self is just so calm and calm. It says, come to me, you who are troubled for, I am not, I can hold you. You can get bigger. I am bigger still. Um, so when there's access to that, the, the exile can feel whatever they need to feel. And that feels very refreshing to them. So Christine says, she likes that I'm here now. She actually sees that there's someone, myself, here, and she is very surprised. As soon as that happens, she calms down and she wants to talk to me. She's not charged anymore. Um, so Jay says, oh, so she's more relaxed and open to you now. Uh, there's a note that says, now that the part isn't flooding Christine with her panic, Christine can be in self and the little girl has someone to rely on, which allows her to calm down. Yep. Christine says, yes, that's right. Jay asks, what does she want to tell you? This is the witnessing step. Um, so again, just like there was some negotiation with the protector to unblend a little bit to be with, um, that can be something that happens with the exile as well. To let them know I see you and um, do you see me? Do you trust me? Can, can I relate to you? Then once they have that, then again, just what do you want me to know or what do you want to tell me? And this is really the witnessing phase. Christine says how hard it's been for her, how she's had to do it all on her own. She's really frightened. She didn't know what was happening. Nobody was there. My impulse is to ask her what the situation was. And Jay says, that sounds good. So he trusts that she's in self, right? And she's feeling curious. Christine says, I can see how my mind jumps in and says it was in the hospital when I was a baby, but I'm not sure. I want her to tell me. So that's really good noticing by Christine that this kind of intellectual thinking part is saying, oh, it must be this, right? Whenever we're trying to think up the answers, um, we can ask that part to give space and just receive an answer directly from the part, which she notices. 
The note says Christine has an intellectual idea of where the exile's fear comes from in her childhood, but to be sure it's accurate, she needs the information to come from the exile experientially. So she asks her. This also allows the work to proceed in the alive, embodied, embodied way that it needs to, not in, in the intellectual way. Okay, so Christine says, she is telling me it is dark. The lights are out and nobody loves her. Nobody's there. So that means that nobody loves her. There's no one to take care of her. And there's a note that says, this is the childhood experience that created the burdens of fear and panic and the belief that no one loves her. So he, Jay here is translating what the child's saying to understand what the burdens that they took on were, right? It's this feeling of panic in the body and this belief, no one's here, so that means no one loves me. Christine says, and so from the point of view of self, when I hear that, I want to hold her. I want to sit her on my lap. Jay says, go ahead and do that. Um, Christine has a wonderful, spontaneous impulse to comfort the little girl. She is reparenting the part, which is an aspect of the healing process. So she's a she's witnessed where she is, where this part's stuck, what she's experiencing. She really gets it. And now she wants to comfort her and reparent her. Christine says, I'm struck by the little body that doesn't have tension in it. It's very soft, undefended little body. There's a weight, a heaviness in the heart she's carrying around. Okay, the heaviness in the heart comes from hopelessness that nothing's going to get better. And she has to carry this burden all by herself because nobody else is there. And there it is. I can see the thread now when nobody is there to pick her up. There's a contraction, a closing off, like a walling off. There's fearful watching in the cells of the body. This heavy heart has formed over time. It's not one event that does it. It sort of chips away. The heaviness comes from her inability to change anything. And then there's a note that says, the heaviness in the little girl's heart is a response to many events over a number of years in Christine's early childhood. This is a really kind of an experience of complex trauma. It sounds like maybe of neglect um, in which no one was there for her when she needed comfort or holding. Gradually, the little girl grew hopeless about getting the care she needed. Jay says the thing that formed in the cells of the body, what was that? So his curiosity is showing. Christine says the watchfulness, the alertness, guarding, protecting, closing off from the world. It's like a defense. It's a felt thing. This sounds to me like a, another part, but protective part. Uh, she says, like a catch in the tissues. Now there's a sense of being frightened and caught in the dark by herself. That feeling is much younger. It goes way back. I'm getting a specific memory. She's flailing her arms and legs. Somebody's supposed to come pick her up, but they don't come. And now I'm getting a vague memory of something dangling in a crib and a hollow sound. There's a sense of trying to get somewhere to get picked up, but no one's there. And Jay reflects, she desperately needs to be picked up, but no one comes. So um, the note says, in the middle of witnessing the little girl's story, Christine has accessed an even younger part, which we'll call the baby. So it's a little girl and the baby. Um, who has earlier memories related to the feelings of aloneness and panic. We still don't know exactly when this was or what the external circumstances were, but that's not that is not necessary for healing. Okay, so this is very common, actually. Just a side note um, with complex trauma is that there will be so many experiences of calling out and not being heard, not being tended to, feeling alone, helpless, unloved. So the little girl is holding this, but she's showing it goes all the way back. Um, and so sometimes you can even ask, what, what's the earliest memory of this? And um, are there any other memories you want to show? Okay, Christine says, yes, it's interesting that I say that because this is 
different from how the little girl feels. I can't quite make sense of that. Jay says, well, sure, this younger memory is a different part. And Christine says, oh, I see. The little girl comes later. And Jay has a note that says the baby has some very early memories of being stranded in her crib when she really needed to be picked up and comforted. Christine seems to have had experiences like this over the next few years, which left the little girl, who was stuck at four years old, with similar feelings of being alone and panicked and helpless and guarded. Christine says, well, right now something is shifting by itself, I think. By feeling both of them, there is less charge. And she pauses and Jay says, would you like a suggestion? Christine says, I would. Um, the note says, now that Christine has witnessed the story and the feelings of both these parts, she can move on to healing them. Um, so I just want to make a note that, you know, sometimes people will refer to it as like the same part at different ages or maybe different parts. And, and there's no right or wrong. It is whatever makes sense to you. There can be a knowing in your system. This is the same part. This is a separate part. Um, I know, you know, Cassandra, my people pleaser, who's six, she protects so many parts. And it's interesting. She protects many, many parts younger than her and many parts older than her because she had to really amp up her game um, in lots of different circumstances. So she had so many memories that she wanted me to witness and reparent and redo. Um, so whatever is shown in your system is worthy of getting to know. Okay. So Jay's going to give his suggestion. He says, focus on the baby and bring yourself into that place where she's all alone and just see what she needs from you. Christine says she wants me to pick her up. Jay said, go ahead and do that. Christine says she cries louder and she just clings. And now I am nuzzling her around the ears and she's just clinging to me. I see her bald head. She's quite young, and she doesn't have much hair. It's just soft down. Jay says, can she sense that you're there? Um, and he points out that she is reparenting the baby. And I ask this question to make sure that the baby is receiving what Christine is giving her. Yeah, you always ask, you know, it's a good thing to ask, how's the part experiencing you? And Christine says, very much so. Jay says, how is she responding? Christine says, she's softening. She's not crying anymore. She's feeling into me and resting into me. And now there's a little burp. You know, when a baby has been crying and there's a little aftershock going through her, I can feel it in her back. So it sounds like the baby is really responding well to Christine's reparenting. Christine says, well, okay, I don't know if this is right or not, but what happened is that the little girl with the little body and the heavy heart wants to hold the baby. So I am letting her do that. Jay says, okay. Okay, and I'm just going to have a side note. I have a hunch here, and this is just my, uh, probably my analytical part, but is... Um, I wonder if the little girl, the four-year-old actually in many ways protected the baby. Like, cause it says that in, in the fabric of her, her cells, she had this hypervigilance essentially. And that's a really protective role to have. Um, and so I think that it, in many ways, she's both an exile and a protector. It's kind of like nesting dolls. <laughs> um, okay. So she lets the little girl hold her. And Christine says, it's so sweet. The whole thing has now just shifted to this beautiful playtime. And I feel so much love, not just from me to these little ones, but both of them are bathed in love. They are totally relaxed. And Christine sighs. Um, Jay's con er, note says, the reparenting seems to have gone well. So I suggest we move on to the next healing step of unburdening. Uh, let's see if he retrieves them or not. Jay says the baby has taken on certain feelings like panic and loneliness as a result of being left alone in the dark. If it is appropriate, we can do an unburdening where she releases those emotions she took on 
It is possible that some of them have already been released during this process, then it might be helpful to conduct an internal ritual to release them further. Check with the baby to see if she would like to release them. Okay, so perhaps they were kind of spontaneously retrieved. Obviously, they were with her and the baby and the girl were together. They seem to be in this interspace somewhere. So it is, I guess, like they've been retrieved from their respective times. And now Jay is leading her through this unburdening. Christine laughs and cries and says, okay, goodness. And Jay says, what is happening? Christine said, there's a rush of sadness and pain. And then when I asked that question, she wanted to grow up so she could be with the little girl. It's like an accelerated growth thing without any blocks in the way. I felt a big rush of emotion coming up and it moved through my heart and into my body. Jay says, was that okay? Christine says, yes, it felt good. And Jay says, good. Christine says, the baby is happy. He says, you know, it seems that the baby has had a spontaneous unburdening that came from me just mentioning the possibility of the ritual. And of course, this can only happen because of all the good work that had already occurred in this session. Now I have Christine check to see if the actual unburdening ritual is still needed. Jay says, I offered to do an unburdening ritual and then this feeling moved through you. Check to see if that is all that is needed or if the ritual would be helpful. Christine says the baby's fine now from whatever the rush was, but the little girl seems to need an unburdening ritual. Yeah, check with all the parts. Jay says, okay, what burdens is the little girl carrying? Uh, Christine says the heavy heart, the despair, the sense that things will never change, that she'll always have to carry the panic and the fear of the baby. Mm. Jay says, first check to see if she's aware that the baby is happy now. Um, yeah, because again, I, I, you know, it's not super important to define, oh, this is a protector, this is an exile. But you can just see by the nature of it that she's was protecting the, the baby in a sense. So she can't release her burden and, until she knows that the baby is free. So he's checking, you know, does she know that? Um, does she see what happened with the baby? Excuse me. Um, and Christine says, yes, she wants to play with the baby. That's interesting. Even though she's playing with the baby, there's still a belief that she's got to look after it and carry that burden. Even though she's seen with her own eyes that the baby is happy, she still thinks she can't let go of the heaviness of her hopelessness. Jay says, okay, ask the little girl if she would like to release that heavy heart that she's carrying and the belief that things will never change. Christine said, that's disorienting because she believes that that is who she is. And without that belief, she wouldn't be there. That's very, very common. Um, and this can be with exiles or protectors that without their belief, their role, their burden, they don't know they've been carrying it so long they don't know who they are without it right i've had many many of my parts express that same thing how can i get rid of it i have no idea who i would be without it jay says let her know that if she lets go of that belief she can take on any other role she wants she can be whatever she wants to be so they would need to know we're not trying to get rid of you you won't be obliterated um, you can invite in new qualities. You can be whoever you want to be. Um, there's a note that says parts are not defined by the negative beliefs and emotions they took on in childhood, which IFS calls their burdens. They have their own potential that is intrinsic to them. That is why they can let go of a burden and take on a new role in the psyche. So I explained this to the little girl. Christine says, yeah, she wants to let go of that so she can play. She can see that that would be fun. Jay says, good, check and see how she is carrying the burden in her heavy heart and the hopeless belief. Where does she carry those in her body or on her body? Christine said, there's a weight around her heart and the rest of it is almost like a heavy mantle that she wears over her head and back and shoulders. And she's now allowed to be joyful. 
Jay says, okay, she can have those washed away by water, blown away by wind, or she can give them up to the light, put them in the earth, have them burned in fire, or anything that feels right to her. Um, Jay says, IFS has discovered that it is helpful to release a burden to one of the basic elements in nature, earth, fire, wind, water, or light. This signifies that the burden will not come back because it has been carried away or transformed by something elemental and powerful. Christine says she wants them to be transformed so nobody else has to carry them. So she listens inside and she says, burning. Jay says she wants to burn them in a fire. Okay, so arrange that. And Christine says she wants to burn her little dress as if that is the burden. That's so weird, but that's what she's saying. She wants another dress. I had a part that did this exact thing. Um, again, whatever they, whatever symbolizes the burden to them, I had um, a part that wanted this apartment that I was in to be taken up in a tornado um, uh, or, you know, had things burned in a fire, like the pew from the church was burned in the fire. Um, different pieces of clothing uh sometimes it's a backpack or a boulder or just uh something inside that's cleansed through water or vomit or whatever you know there's all kinds of different things but i like how she's this you can tell that she's in self and she's listening to the girl because it feels surprising to her she's like oh this is interesting okay we'll do this um okay so jay says as this is happening Feel the burden leaving her body and take as much time as she needs until it is gone. Yeah, as a as the facilitator, when a person is doing this, you can just say, you know, take as much time as you need, stay with them until they feel like the burden is released and let me know. A lot of times people think that this is going to take a long time. It doesn't. Um, in my experience, the witnessing stage can potentially take the longest of the of the stages. The unburdening um, usually doesn't take more than a couple minutes. Christine says, that's interesting. She felt quite disoriented and scared in the moment that it was changing, but I held her hand and now she has a new dress. Jay says, are all the burdens gone now? Christine says, yeah. Jay says, so notice what positive qualities are emerging in her now that the burdens are gone. The note says, now that the unburdening ritual has been completed, there is room for the exile to embody positive qualities that are innate to it. So in my experience, sometimes you can ask them, what qualities do you want to invite in? But a lot of times they just spontaneously, naturally begin showing basically who they were before the burden came onto them. They have childlike qualities like playfulness, energy, dancing, skipping, jumping, twirling, doing somersaults. <laughs> um, but you can also ask what they want to bring in. Christine says she's grateful. The two of them are actually looking up at the smoke from the burning dress as it blows away. It is so bizarre. Somebody in here is a bit embarrassed by all this, but these images are coming, so I'm going to say them anyway. They are playing footsie with each other. I mean, I couldn't make this up. It's really happening, and it's sweet. All these little feet. <laughs> you can see that it has this picture here of Christine and then the, the little girl and the baby playing footsie. And it really is like a, an inner family. And if you, I hope you've experienced this. If you haven't, I mean, this is really how it is. It's like, it's not like you're making it up. It's like you're watching a movie and it's coming to you. And it's it's often very delightful and sometimes delightfully surprising <laughs> so jay says there's just one uh three quarters of a page left jay says that's wonderful and the unburdening sounds complete so now check with the confuser and see if she is aware of the work that you just did so now we're coming full circle back to the protector to check back in christine says i remember that she was sitting back in the lawn chair Oh, this is a real English expression. She's gobsmacked. Jay says, what does that mean? Christine says, it means she's shocked. Her words are taken away, but she's okay. 
Jay says, ask her if she still feels the need to create confusion. Christine pauses and says, no, she seems to feel like that is not necessary anymore. So the note says the confuser only needed to perform its protective role of creating confusion as long as the little girl and the baby were in pain. It has been paying attention, so it realizes that role is no longer needed and that it can now take on the new one. Jay says, good, ask her if she would like to have a different role in your psyche. Christine says, well, let's see. She wants to be a kind of guide or mentor for the little girl so that she will not feel alone. It's nice. Jay says, great. See if any other parts want to say anything before we end. Christine said, there is one part I've never met. She's in awe of the process and of what's possible when the other parts don't interfere, being able to create such a beautiful thing. I can plumb the depths and access something without the usual limiting voices. That feels very strange to this part. The self says, of course this can happen, but this part feels it has never seen these depths before. Thank you very much. It has been quite a journey. And Jay says, what a wonderful session. The exile and protectors have been unburdened and the protectors have let go of their protective roles and taken on new healthy ones. So yeah, a lot of times when the protectors are unburdened, basically when what they protect has been healed, they no longer have to do their job. Um, they become just very supportive members, mentors to other parts. I also love that image of like the parts playing footsie and stuff because the parts inside have relationship with each other too, right? That the self is this kind of loving inner parent and the parts care about each other if a part is protecting another part it cares about it deeply and once it feels the support of the self and that it can relax it can just become a child again and can relate to the the younger parts as a, a sibling rather than being a parentified child essentially uh, so i hope you appreciated that i know it was quite long if you have made it this far um it's just such a great example of a full session of all the parts of, of an IFS session. So if you have any questions about that or comments you want to make about that, I would love for you to leave them in the comments below.